Greetings, greetings and salutations. What's up, y'all? It's me, your daddy, Roboito, and this is Requiem for a Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in. Rate, review, and subscribe. All the links in the description below. You know the usual. Not going to do the whole spiel. Uh, to the delight of few and the chagrin of many, your boy Solo this week, Justice could not keep the streak alive. So you're stuck with old Adam. Solo pod. Uh, we got a lot to get into this week. I'll be brief on a few things to start. Number one, the Grammys were last night. Don't care. Uh, always an excruciating watch to sit through and usually disappointing and predictable results. Uh, I suppose you could say like, well, why do you care if somebody you like wins then if they don't matter? That is the irony, you know, it is exciting when somebody like wins something, but it's just like, it just isn't going to happen. So it's like Grammys kind of don't matter unless you like them, like the artist. But then that kind of means the Grammys matter, so I, I don't know how I feel. I'm on the fence with that. But regardless, the show is horrendous almost always. So if this one was good, what can you do? Didn't see it. <laughs> uh, the Pro Bowl revamped edition was also yesterday. Recording here on a Monday, obviously, for you sticklers out there. It was good, I think, you know, for the weirdest all-star game because the season's over. Nobody cares. The important players that are in the Super Bowl can't play. Uh, but look, it sucked before. Now it's slightly better, a little more competition. You see guys' faces, a little more personality involved. They seemed like they were having fun, a unique way to go about it. Uh, I'm all for it. Uh, the skills competition leaves a lot to be desired. A lot, of, a lot of gimmicky silliness, but hey, for a first run, not too bad. We can work out those kinks. Much obliged. <laughs> uh, Super Bowl's coming. Am I going to do a Super Bowl preview episode? I'm not. I'm not. Only because I haven't been keeping up on the sports corners as it is. And I don't know my bets yet. And also, again, we went over this last year. Like, what's the difference? What I fucking bet. Who cares? I'll recap my horrific losses if they're amusing. But uh, that's about it. <laughs> but I am excited. Nonetheless, best day of the year coming soon. Okay. Um, There's a couple other things I watched hoping to get some episode material uh, but look, the spark just wasn't there. So I'll recap briefly due to relevancy only. But uh, a couple things just didn't tickle my fancy. Number one, once the Oscars list came out, I was like, all right, I got to see as many movies that are accessible on here as possible. The biggest of which was everything, everywhere, all at once. It's on It's every category, every award show. Everybody seems to love this movie. I am not everybody. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Uh, I thought it was kind of tedious and annoying, and I don't really see the appeal. It just seems like, like I, I guess it was pretty well made, but, you know, doesn't seem like anything that crazy it's one of those where it's like where's this hype coming from there's a ton of movies like this all the time you know like i would say it's as good as palm springs which is like a groundhog day type movie this is a multiverse movie but they're about the same level of quality across the board uh and entertainment you know I, like oh that was you know pretty solid cool concept i guess also, like, the main protagonist lady was a dick to everybody in her family. It's like, why, why is this appealing? My, my classic thing of, like, just because you want your character to be something, 
if that something is negative, they still need to be likable ultimately, or it doesn't work. It's like the lady's a bitch. Her husband should leave her and her kid shouldn't like her. I mean, what do you want me to say? Yeah, we get it. She had a rough upbringing. You know, I'm, I mean, sorry. I, I just don't get it. You know, it's one of those things where they're like, ah, it's about minorities. So we love it. And it's like, yeah, that's true. And I'm glad that it is. You know, you swap these people out for any race of people. I still don't like the movie. So. <laughs> but hey, good for them and everyone involved, I suppose. Congrats. People like it. I'm not one. What can I say? I'm still fucking hacking up mucus. Your boy's playing injured. Keep that in mind. Uh, but yeah, I everything everywhere all at once is a movie. And uh, that's all I got for that. I, I don't get it. Not for me, I guess. What can you say? Next up. That 90s show. A little reboot action of that 70s show. Uh, another thing I just think completely missed the mark, I think in a weird parallel equivalency, kind of reminds me of Girl Meets World, uh, on a similar scale, like Boy Meets World was a children, teen, tween show, and then they rebooted it for even younger children, seemingly, and, uh, didn't get it. But regardless, that show was meant to be for kids. So as an adult, I should not have liked that show. The difference here, right, is that like that 70s show itself is a show for adults that teenagers will like because it's about being teenagers. It's for adults because of their nostalgia factor for the 70s. And, you know, it was primetime television show. So that's more for adults than anyone else. Could be wrong about that, but you know what I mean, right? It's a show for adults about kids. It's not a kid's show, you know, even if it's for college people, those are technically adults, but you get my point, right? Like that show's not for 12-year-olds. That 90s show is for 12-year-olds. Now, I didn't watch enough of it to get into it because I found it dull and horrible, but... <laughs> uh, just as I did early episodes of that 70s show, you know, like kind of rewatch. It's like, man, I'm watching actual 12 year olds here. I don't like that. So maybe it'll age into itself. I don't know. But either way, the themes will seem to be a little more mature. The characters did, too. Again, to some degree. Obviously, they're not. Uh, but it just didn't work. I don't know. I also don't know. Can't speak on how effective the 70s nostalgia is in that 70s show. I doubt very much other than the decor and stuff. Uh, but nothing about this show is like, ah, this is so 90s. Like what a, you know, what a trip down memory lane. Didn't get any of those vibes in the two episodes. And uh, yeah, just isn't doesn't seem like they got it right it's almost like because it's a netflix original they can narrow the scope of who this is for and it seems like they went with let's make this for children today which i you know that's your viewer base you're trying to attack you got a lot of them watching uh you hope to have long-term customers blah 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 all the strategy that goes into things nowadays that never did before and is ruining shows like this uh you know, whatever. Again, same thing. People like it, whatever. Uh, I think it's dumb. <laughs> and yeah, that's about it. Kitty and Red were, you know, pretty good. But like, that's it. I, I have no interest in the new kids, especially because they're kids. And I don't want to watch things about kids. So it just doesn't work for me. You know? And the setup was weird. She just like walks into someone's house and starts being their friend. I, it doesn't really make sense. And they redo the keg thing from the first one. But that's the irony of it is like in that 70s show that they went to go buy a tap and the dude's like, you could just buy a tap. You don't need to be 21. That's how I remember it, at least. And then in this one, 
sh- the lady like demands an ID and they get away with it because the girl. But it doesn't matter. Point is, it's like you could buy a tap handle or pump, whatever. That there's nothing illegal about that. So it was just silly that they redid it and made it even more stupid. Whatever. Uh, just not for me. We'll put it in the camp of just not for me. So, <laughs> I gave two things a shot, and those didn't work. However, gave a couple other things a shot, and they took. Oh, baby, did they take. So, back in the realm of Oscars talk, little movie called Tar. Kate Blanchett, masterful performance, as everyone had described. Now, this movie is labeled as like a psychological drama or something of that nature. So I was expecting a little more like Black Swan type deal. Like, oh, it's a classical composer in modern times and it's dark and blah, blah, blah. So I don't know. I thought there'd be some kind of like twist or like supernatural element or something wild. To come up and I was pleasantly surprised in just that this is just a great drama film. So I don't know this, I guess psychological because of like her mental breakdown throughout the movie, but that's just a drama to me, whatever semantics, I suppose. Oh, uh, this movie's great. So this is in Uh, For lack of a better term, this is a statement on cancel culture overall, which is not what I expected, you know, out of a movie that's about a classical composer. Uh, But what an interesting avenue to go down, I guess, because nobody will really give a shit if they don't get the world right or something like that. You know, you can kind of just make shit up as to how this will work out or to like what the lifestyle would be like, you know. So essentially... Kate Blanchett, Tar, Lydia Tar, we'll just call her Tar going forward. Tar is at the height of her game. The one thing I would say is a little extreme about the movie is that they made her an EGOT winner. A little extreme. You know, how many world famous composers are there in general, let alone one with an EGOT? Again, I don't know, I guess. Haven't looked into it. So maybe it's not as unfeasible as I think. Uh, (laughs) essentially she's kind of an asshole now is that because she's as famous as she is has kind of earned her place to that did she get to this place by being an asshole you don't really know they don't give you backstory necessarily and they don't show you things that are referenced to in the movie like there's not flashbacks like oh how did she get to this point in her life there's just subtle references throughout it now essentially there's email communication going on that she's not really reading because her assistant does all her work for her you know checks out between tar and an ex who was also a member of the choir essentially she like fucked her and then ditched her and kind of smeared her name and ruined her life and you don't know what's true what isn't true because all you know is little bits of back and forth in like small little fragments now while that's going on she's also trying to like run some new symphony thing in berlin they're getting ready for a new recording uh and a similar thing begins to happen with a new cellist and you like watch that affair kind of blossom so you kind of get That this is like a repeat thing that goes on. Okay? And her wife is also a part of the choir and is kind of watching this happen. Uh, And there's also a moment in the movie where Tar is lecturing at Juilliard. And there's like a woke kid who's like, I don't like old men because they're misogynists. And she's like, it was 400 years ago. Like, the music's great. What are you talking about? 
Uh, and she kind of just like tears this kid a new asshole and he's kind of like, all right, I get it. And she's like, no, 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 no. I don't think you do. And just like reams the shit out of him to a point which I will agree. It becomes a little inappropriate. Like she makes her point like 15 different times and kind of could let it go. Uh, so I see that side of the argument, but then the kid himself, whose whole point is trying to be like, well, I don't like composers who are terrible to women, eventually can't take it, the berating anymore, and then calls her a bitch, which is ironic in and of itself. Anyway, point is, eventually the video leaks, it's super chopped down and edited, so she sounds way worse than she ever could, based on what actually happened. Point being, she was mostly right for all of that argument as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and then especially because he then calls her a bitch, kind of loses his own mighty wokeness about how much he appreciates and respects women. But I digress. All of this comes together kind of at once. And the girl, aforementioned with email correspondence, commits suicide and then it all gets leaked and combined together and she essentially gets canceled. And then it gets worse and worse. She attacks the guy who replaces her at the Berlin Symphony and ends up conducting a video game score thing in the Philippines. Anyway, a lot of stuff happens in between. It's all very good. It's all very entertaining. The movie's a bit long, two and a half hours, but boy, does it fly by. And it does a great job of slowly building everything up, revealing little bits of information, revealing little bits about Tar herself. They kind of show her real personality in different scenarios. But ultimately, what I'm getting at in how it's a great portrait of what cancel culture is, is that you don't see any actual abuse. Again, she kind of berates the kid and berates is a strong word. She's not like screaming at this kid, right? She's just in some ways trying to educate, you know, she is a guest lecturer or whatever at a school, but also really trying to hammer home her point of view and, you know, it was hard for her to make it, blah, 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 all that type of stuff. But, like in reality, all you can see is what comes out, right? So you see the articles, you see tweets, you see whatever, but you never actually really know what happened. And this movie doesn't tell you. Like, it seems like she might be kind of an asshole, but, like, is she a monster? Do you know what I mean? Like, there's a big distinction between that. Like, is she just a dick? Was she a dick who manipulated people and tore people down to get to where she was? Did she get there then become... You know what I mean? Like, you don't really know. Is she just driven or is she, like, a liar and a fake? Does she bring people down and whatever? You don't know. Is she actually a super genius? You don't know. Like, that's the thing. You can kind of interpret it how you want. Just like you would with a celebrity. Like, oh, I view this person as a genius. Therefore, I think maybe the way they're portrayed is misconstrued. Or I didn't like that person to begin with. So I believe everything that I'm reading. You know what I mean? All that type of stuff is kind of portrayed. Because they don't do flashbacks, like I said. And they don't do private Thing. Like, it's weird. Like, obviously, they show private moments. This isn't presented in some kind of, like, quasi-documentary or anything like that. Um, but outside of the lecture, which they have to show you to then show the heavily edited version, which you could tell that's what's going to happen as it's going on. They don't, like, maybe, I don't remember. I don't think they explicitly, like, show someone recording that lecture. But it, you can just tell as she's doing it, like, oh, this is a bad idea. Run all these kids? You got to be kidding me. Uh, <laughs> but that's kind of like the mystery of the movie is like, does she deserve to be taken down to this degree? You decide kind of, which is just actually how it is. It's like, we never really know. Now there's the bad ones that seem very, very clear. And then 
that's different, but a lot of gray areas. And it's kind of words against words, your opinion against somebody. You know what I mean? And it's a very interesting dynamic, and I think they did it pretty subtly. It's not... I mean, it's very clearly what the movie's about, so it's not that subtle, but you know what I'm saying. They don't give you a definitive answer. They want you to decide, and I think that's brilliant. It comes at it from both sides, you know? Whichever camp you might be on. You could interchange either way. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. Uh, I thought it was excellent. Available on Peacock, of all things, which was frustrating, by the way, because I bought a four-year consideration screener at a premium price. It was like 15 bucks, nothing crazy. It arrived, news dropped that it was dropping on Peacock right after. Waste of money. Waste of money. Uh, <laughs> kind of worth it, though. Great film. Uh, something interesting about it, which I've always wondered why this isn't more common. Full credits to start the film. They force you to watch it. Um, which also, like, is tightly wound in the theme of the movie about, like, who deserves credit for what. And things like that. Because obviously as a conductor, like, she can be the star, but there is... She can't be a star without a full orchestra who gets the credits. She does, you know, kind of treat her musicians like shit. Uh, so anyway, all very thematic and tied in and whatever. But also, I just have always kind of wondered, like, why don't directors do that more? Like, if the credits truly mattered to someone in a movie, like, if you were truly appreciative of all the people that worked on this and blah 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 you know wouldn't you want to maybe recognize them in a way that people actually see because i mean it very very it's like a six percent of people that go to movies stay like for the full credits like just to view and appreciate them outside of like you know marvel bullshit where they force you to for some little nugget about you know whatever that's not important anyway like, yeah, they're making another one. <laughs> like, <laughs> what do you expect? Anyway, you could also just look it up after. They always go on YouTube. Whatever. Point being, watch Tar. It's great. Uh, great movie year, to be honest. Like, movies are back. <laughs> Art's back. 2023, great things to come. Uh, also, apologies if some of these, some parts of this sound like fragmented and weird and whatnot. Having some technical issues where the recording just stops and cuts out and I have to keep going back and recutting. And anyway, not your problem, but my disaster. So thanks for tuning in yet again. Uh, <laughs> little mid-episode shout out to y'all. Boy, do I love you guys. So last but certainly not least, we're keeping it brief here today, folks. Feeling a little spacey today, if you can't already tell. Too much coffee, too much weed. It's like you're hyped up, but you want to go to sleep, and I'm kind of just foggy, you know? I got fog brain. Isn't that a thing? Is that from something? Brain fog? I don't know. I'm in a fugue state. Uh, <laughs> so, let's talk about The Last of Us, shall we? Legendary video game, of which I've never played. Now, I'm an Xbox guy, so what can I say? Uh, never really had the opportunity. I was, of course, aware of it. The level of acclaim that the game got is nearly unrivaled. I mean, there's a handful of games you could list out, which I will not do right now, but you get my point. The second one came out, same thing, which you would never expect from sequels typically, although video game sequels are way more on point than film sequels. They almost, they spend more time on it knowing that the return will be greater. 
Hollywood could learn some lessons. Uh, anyway, the show comes out on HBO. I cannot stop hearing about it, right? And, you know, an HBO adaptation is a great sign, but a video game adaptation is usually a worse sign. Uh, so, you know, I was just kind of whatever about it. And the momentum, week after week after week, it's like, all right, I got to at least check this out, see for myself, you know? And pure greatness is all I can say. Not knowing much about the story, vague elements, you know, I know it's the post-apocalyptic thing, virus type thing, not quite zombies. Essentially, it's I Am Legend. Like, maybe a little later on in the timeline, or not even really, just about a different group, not about a solo guy, is the best way to describe it, if you're interested and are unaware you know, society has completely fallen apart. There's little gr- pockets of, you know, co-ops and whatever. There's grifters and shady people and whatever. You know, don't trust anybody, all this type of thing. Tribalism at its finest. It's uh, centered around a man who's alone. I'm not going to spoil anything for this because it's too early in the show and there's not a lot to really go through. What am I going to run through the plot? I don't even know how it ends. You know what I mean? Uh, But it's a man who's alone and there's a girl who's got the cure. Classic story. Even in the show, though, they're like, another one? Everybody claims this shit. Somebody's immune, whatever. We got the cure. This girl, at least as of now, appears to be fully immune, and he's got a transporter across the country. It doesn't really make sense why he needs to go across the country. They don't know where he's got to take her, but he's got to go find his brother, and his brother knows stuff and people, I guess. Anyway, they're driving from Boston to fucking Wyoming, right? Somehow they end up in Kansas City and like they mentioned getting lost, but it's like, why would you ever drive that far? Like that's so far south out of the way. Maybe they got lost initially and ended up going west, but like still, no matter what, it just seems like that guy would be savvy enough to know that they went like four hours too far south. So biggest nitpick so far. Seems unlikely. Also, he just has this girl read the map. She doesn't know what a map is. She'd never been in a car. She was born after this all happened. So I'm just confused. Why wouldn't he just read the map, chart it out, and just be like, all right, we're going to follow this path. Like, you, you don't have a highlighter or something? You know? There's no way nobody has any pens or something. I, Anyway, it's fine. I'm, I'm all right. Like, just doesn't make any sense, you know? (laughs) That's all I'm saying. Uh, But it's very good. Uh, I guess they diverted from the plot for episode three, which is kind of like an own little, like, pocket story. Kind of gives you... They're sprinkling in backstory and flashbacks, which I kind of like. They're going through, like, decades of how this all went down, a little bit of, like, before, during, you know what I mean? To present day. It's really good stuff. Uh, A gut-wrenching emotional episode was episode three. I absolutely loved it. Nick Offerman with performance of the year so far, I gotta say. He did a lot with his eyes. And uh, that man should be winning an award that is long overdue for this episode. So shout out to HBO yet again being the pinnacle of television. The Last of Us is excellent. I'm very excited for the season to unfold and uh they're putting it on hbo max before the weekend so they know the streaming's going well they're giving us the sneak peek very excited about that we'll be right on top of it as i hope you will be right on top of rate reviewing and subscribing to requiem for a tuesday merch rfat.bitcartel.com instagram at adam.rfat linktree slash rfat's got all the music youtube's podcasts everything you could want that i am a part of as well as justice who could not be here today he'll be back soon we got a we got a list of things to discuss at a later time enjoy the super bowl everybody 
I know I will. And remember, I are fat. You are fat. We are fat. Calculator.